today, uh, uh, my uh, today's lecture is about uh, so we'll continue learning about linear algebra uh, and probability and statistics uh, for artificial intelligence. And here you see uh, this uh, a grave, uh, two pictures of the grave, and this grave is uh, of Mr. Thomas Bayes. And he is the guy who, in 1970s, uh, established uh, Bayes theorem. Uh, so he's pioneer, uh, in a way, uh, to infer uh, uh, from the consequences. Like you have a hypothesis and a systematic way, so you keep changing the probability of a hypothesis. So we'll see that how uh, Mr. Thomas Bayes has influenced uh, what we know today uh, a lot in machine learning and also in probability theory. So uh, this is lecture uh, we did last time. Uh, more focus was on data representation, that how you represent voice and video and images and graphs and networks. And uh, so then we started learning about linear algebra and I elaborated that how linear algebra is uh, uh, so important for AI. Uh, today we'll, we'll continue learning uh, linear algebra. I also discussed startup ideas last time. Uh, so uh, this is for sorry, week three. Uh, so we'll be learning about probability and random variable. Uh, and then a little bit of uh, Python that we had a session where Dr. Ali took on Python that how you can uh, uh, Python that how you can uh, generate code uh, from chat GPT and then run it on Google OLA. So uh, this is uh, uh, where kind of we left and we left that uh, in uh, AI and machine learning uh, mostly a sample can be represented uh, or a particular mm, uh, feature can be represented as a vector. And if you represent a person or an object as a vector, a word as a vector for example, then you can find the similarity of these two words uh, by computing cosine of the angle between the vectors. And we know that cosine of the angle is very simple, that if you have two vectors, you just compute the dot product. But the dot product, once you compute, is equal to A dot B is equal to A magnitude, B magnitude, cosine of angle theta. So that's the, uh, let me just, so, so it is A magnitude, let me take, uh, let me change the color and it's now, I hope the people online can see the board. A, a magnitude, B magnitude, cosine of theta is equal to A dot B, and these are the vectors. So this is the, uh, so you got to, if you only want, if you are interested in cosine of angle theta, so you need to divide by the magnitude of A and magnitude of B, and then you get the cosine of the angle. And we know the cosine is an angle which varies like this. Cosine of zero is one and cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So, so if two things are similar, they will be in the same line. The vector will be directing in the same direction. And if they are un unrelated to each other, they will be orthogonal. If they are opposite, they'll be 180 degrees. So we covered this and uh, So, uh, so the cosine similarity is one of the similarity. There are even more, but this is where you compute so, uh, cosine similarity by computing the dot product of the two vectors. And how you compute dot product is very simple, element by element multiplication. So you take element of first, element of second you multiply, then element first, second multiply, and then add them up together. So just, uh, and that's what it shows that corresponding elements of the two vectors are multiplied and all the products are added and that gives you the dot product. So dot product computation is very simple. So if they are in the same line, they will have maximum magnitude, okay? And because cosine of zero is one, so you are multiplying it with one. But if they are just orthogonal to each other, they are unrelated. So, so, so cosine is going to be zero. So you will find 
zero similarity. And, and then we also covered that uh, in AI, uh, you primarily are multiplying a matrix, uh, which is uh, usually uh, stores the weights of a network if it is you are using a neural network. And even in other algorithms, we will see that once we say model, what is model? Model is these weights. Once you train a model, you are training the weights. So weights are the model, okay? And this vector, this vector is usually uh, uh, the input that you provide to this. So if you even have a two-dimensional, let's say you have an image, what you do is you put, you change an image, which is a two-dimensional matrix into a 1D matrix, okay? So you put this as a column vector and then feed it to a neural network. This is one type of neural networks, not CNN. And then they realize why not to use the two-dimensional structure of the image and your weights then becomes the mask and the masks are also 2D. So we'll cover that. But otherwise, it is just uh, a vector multiplying weights. And once we say training, training means these that you are uh, changing these weights to get the desired output and uh, the otherwise, uh, uh, the other model. Once you download a model, you're downloading the weights and the way they are connected to each other. We also covered this, that uh, this is uh, Professor uh, Edward Stang uh, perspective uh, that, or is truly this is what it is, that you have a vector, a vector, vector multiplied by a matrix, you get another vector. And today we are just going to extend this discussion. This vector, you again have a set of weights, which is a matrix. So. Uh, a vector multiplied by a matrix giving you a vector multiplied by a matrix giving you a vector multiplied matrix and ultimately you get the desired output. So uh, hopefully the output will be arranged, this array will be arranged to give you the desired whatever you want to desire. If it is a classification problem, it will have the highest value which the object corresponds to. So if it's an object detection problem, let's say there is a car and car is uh, this. Uh, particular output, so here will be the highest value, closer to one. Rest should ideally be zero, but they will not be zero, they will have smaller value. So we are going to see this. But today we are uh, going to discuss something very, very interesting. Very interesting and perhaps uh, some of the, perhaps one of the most complex uh, concept in linear algebra and because that has direct uh, impact on uh, machine learning as well. So we are just going to go deep down into seeing, understanding what it actually is. So to understand this, we need to know that once you are multiplying a vector with a matrix, no matter how small a matrix is, okay, let's say two by two, and, and obviously the vector is also of two dimensions, so take any example, just a random example, and let, let me just take one. So for example, I multiply this, Okay, I take this two, one, minus one, let's say zero. Okay, so this is a matrix and you multiply it with any vector, let's say one and one, any vector. So you, let, let me just represent this vector first in two dimensional space, it is one and one. So it is, this is the vector, one and one. So once I multiply this with this matrix, so I multiply, I get two plus one and I get minus one plus zero, so I get three minus one. So if I plot it here, it is three and minus one. Okay, three minus three, oh sorry, three and plus minus one here. So it is three and minus one. So vector is always, almost always, 99% of the time is going to change its direction and its magnitude. It remains a vector. A vector will remain a vector, but it's going to change its direction and its magnitude for sure. So a matrix multiplied by a vector is going to change, remain in if it is just two by two and two by one, so it will remain in two dimensional space, okay? So, so now, uh, so this is what a, a matrix uh, to a vector is going to do. It's going to either stretch it, squeeze it, rotate it, reflect it, and may compute the orthogonal projection as well. So this, this is what it is going to do. Okay, what if you want that vector after multiplying with the matrix should not change its direction, right? 
what if you want this? Means you want that a vector, a vector, once you multiply with a matrix, it remains at the same angle, theta. May change its magnitude. Okay, it can change its magnitude, but it remains and does not change its direction. Okay. So this is a very interesting problem in linear algebra to solve. And even more important is to understand why do you want to do this? Why? Because a matrix is always going to change, almost always going to change the direction. What if you have a vector and you multiply it with a matrix, any matrix, it remains after the multiplication, it remains keep pointing to the same angle theta. So this is what we need to see. And why do you want to do this crazy? Seems like a crazy thing to do. Why do you ever want that a vector multiplied with a matrix should remain? And so usually you will be given a matrix, okay? Because matrix has this characteristics of changing the direction of a vector. And you got to find out a vector Okay, you need to find out a vector. So uh, today uh, we are going to spend a lot of time uh, in just learning about this and its significance in machine learning. So, uh, and today we are also going to because now we have another aspect of linear algebra from machine learning perspective. It's about vector and vector spaces. And we are going to see that why th these are relevant to AI. Uh, and uh, so learning about bases, learning about spanning a space, learning about eigenvalues and eigenfaces, so what you are going to learn today. Uh, and, uh, and also we will learn that uh, once we are working on an AI or uh, machine learning, uh, we are going to spend a lot of time uh, in just learning about this and its significance in machine learning. So, uh, and today we are also going to, because now we have another aspect of linear algebra from machine learning perspectives about vector and vector spaces. And we are going to see that why th these are relevant to AI. Uh, and uh, so learning about bases, learning about spanning a space, learning about eigenvalues and eigenfaces. So what you are going to learn today. Uh, and. Uh, and also we will learn that uh, once we are working on an AI or uh, machine learning, uh, we got to decide that uh, our feature vector, what is the dimension of our feature vector, okay? And this curse of dimensionality, they say that if you just increase the dimensionality, it becomes a difficult problem to solve. So you always try to have only those features which are really relevant. For example, if I'm going to grade this class, and I put your name as a feature that the name I like, I'll give that name uh, a better grade. And I put your address and things which are totally unrelated. So it becomes a difficult problem. So uh, once uh, we are actually uh, solving uh, a machine learning problem, uh, we try to make sure that we are using a minimum dimension. Then there are techniques to do the, uh, the, the dimensional reduction. For example, uh, once I'm going to grade this class, see the only thing that matters is your marks, the aggregated marks. So it is a 1D space, okay? So it's, it can be plotted in 1D. 1D plot, you don't have to plot. You only have to place a number on this 1D line, okay? Because uh, this line goes from zero to 100. So if somebody got 98 marks, uh, you can just place him here that you got 98 marks, but this is a one dimensional a vector space that it, it is just in one dimension because there is no other dimension uh, to this problem. And I have only uh, one value, one value, and which I'm just going to place whatever that value is. So it's a point on a line is my basically vector space. Okay? So everybody, all the students in this vector space will be a point, okay? Starting from those who have not performed well uh, to somebody who did the best, okay? so. Wait, let me change it. Okay, so let me go. Okay, so the slide was supposed to change. So here is the 
1D vector space. So, uh, so every student is a point on this line. Right? This is 1D vector space. So, 1D vector space, you are just somewhere here. Right? And this may be you uh, who has 98 marks or uh, perhaps not you who, is, who has the minimum marks. So, uh, so it's a vector. So this is you. So you are basically a vector and there's only one direction of the vector. No matter whether you plot it like this or plot it like this or plot this line like this. So you can plot this line in any direction, but it only moves in the same direction, right? only in one direction. So this is a 1D vector space. Uh, a 2D vector space obviously is where you have two features. One is usually we say i and j. So now you are a point in two dimensional vector space. For example, if you want to find out whether you are overweight or not. Okay? So you plot your weight on one axis and, and your height on the other axis. Okay? So, so a vector now can be anywhere in this two dimensional space. Okay? So we say this ij basically span this entire space and every object, every object in the space is going to be a point. Okay? Anywhere in the space, it cannot go into a third, third dimension because there is no third dimension. So this only, uh, this only is a two dimensional space. So your height and weight and you are, if you are 82 kg and your, uh, your height is 5 foot 7 inches, you are a point here. And then you can find out because here is your height and your weight and you are a point. So you can find out whether uh, you are overweight or you are healthy weight or you are underweight or, or you are too <coughs> overweight. So now, so there may be a problem where you require 3D, three dimensions that your features are not height and weight but you have a problem where you got to have three features. So then you are, your space is a three dimensional space. So you have an I and a J and a K. So you have an X axis and Y axis and a Z axis and you are a point in this space. As an object you are a point on this space. For example, uh, and then you can reach to that point as a vector. But vector will move in X direction, then in Y direction, then in Z direction and you get become that point in the space. For example, the, uh, the one which we took earlier was uh, uh, the house uh, prices and uh, and we saw that there were like three maybe features one is the covered area the other other one is number of bedrooms and the third is the price in a pkr so that you have humongous amount of data your house is one of these and so every house becomes a point in this three dimensional space so we say this is a, a 3d vector space and how many d's can there be infinite Okay? Say infinite dimension vector spaces. So uh, it's not like because you can only visualize 3D. As it goes to 4D, you cannot visualize it. Okay? So that's, that's the problem with the visualization, but not with your imagination. With your imagination, it should just run that. No matter how big a space you require to capture your problem, you should just use without worrying about it. You will not able to visualize it. Okay? You will not able to see it. This is important, you will not be able to see it. Just imagine this is four dimension, so you will be somewhere in the four dimension. There is 200 dimension, you will be somewhere in those 200 dimension. Because you cannot visualize it, your visualization basically limits you to be only, uh, to be only uh, in three dimension, okay? So that's fine. So something like this, something like this, okay? So you are a point and if there are many of you, uh, so there are many of these points in three-dimensional space. And so whatever you want to do. So this is the first thing that we just think, focusing on the representation. So you are represented as vectors in an n-dimensional vector space. Okay? So, so then there is this concept of vector spaces. I will not spend too much time. But vector spaces, once we say you are in three dimensional vector space or a two dimensional vector space or in a one dimension vector space you got to adhere to some constraint a vector space can only be a vector space if you can add two vectors 
and you remain in that space. Okay, this is condition number one. That you add two vectors and you remain in that space. And if you multiply a vector with a scalar, you remain in that space. If it's a one dimensional and you are adding one vector to another vector, you get another vector. But you cannot move out of the 1D vector space. Okay, adding two things, you remain there. And same as if you multiply a vector with a scalar, you only move in the same direction. So you got to remain in that space. And then there are 10 axioms as well. We say there has to be a zero vector. So origin is always part of every vector space. You cannot have a vector space where there is no zero. Because zero vector has to be there. Because once you subtract two vectors, you got a zero vector. So zero has to be in the vector space. And so there are others that how you add. But important are these that you add two vectors, you remain in that space. Okay. And if you multiply it with a scalar, you remain in that space. So you're not getting out of the space. Uh, you remain in the space. And these are the 10 axioms, but primarily the same except that there is a zero vector as well. So zero, the origin has to be there. You cannot just live without zero. Uh, so zero is going to be there, but you can add them in any which manner. You can add three vectors also. You still remain in the space. So these are the 10 axioms. So I'm not going to spend too much time, but primarily the same thing. So here, as you can see, this is a vector, this is multiplied by a scalar, and then adding, still you are in the same space. So these are called vector spaces. And we'll shortly see that why these are important. The understanding, so one perspective is just linear algebra, uh, vector multiplication by matrices. Second, more interesting is uh, vector spaces, that you are in a vector space. And why it is important that sometime you are in a three-dimensional vector space, okay? But all your data is on a plane. So I'll give you an example. All your data is in a plane. It is not moving out of the plane. Means your data is two dimensional somehow, but you have created a three dimensional problem. Three dimensional problem, but your data is on a plane or very close to the plane. Or sometimes you are in three dimension, but your data is only moving in one direction, almost. Almost in one direction, okay? So it means that you got to reduce the dimensionality of your problem and now to do that, we are going to see this today. So. So in a vector space, it does not mean that if you are in an n-dimensional vector space, your problem is actually an n-dimensional vector space problem. Okay, it really does not mean. It may be that you have a, in, a, in a larger, bigger vector space, but your problem is a smaller. So you got to have a subspaces in a vector space. Okay, so there are sub-vector spaces in a vector space. In a three-dimensional vector space, there is a three-dimensional subspace, yes but then there is a two dimensional subspace and there is a one dimensional subspace, okay? So there are lines in three dimensions. So this line is in 3D. It is not in 1D, it is in 3D, but it's a line end of the day, right? Same is if it is a wall, that wall is a plane. Though it is in 3D, but it is a plane, okay? So, so we have, uh, we say that you may have uh, a, a situation where like this blue line shows that though you are in a 3D vector space, but you span a 1D, 1D vector space only. Okay? So here is an example. Let's say you have three features, but the features are like moving like this. For example, like you have a feature, I give you an example. You say price in dollars, price in rupees, price in dirham. They mean the same, okay? And you may have like these three features for some reasons. But one changes, the second changes with the, with the same value, with the same proportion. Okay? So you are going to see a point here, a point, and another point, and another point. Okay? So they are kind of changing with the, with the same value. So you have, if your, all your data points are basically on the same line, okay? so it means your data is only spanning a one-dimensional vector space though you have three values. So three values are just changing with the, with the same, same thing. There is no, really they are not helping you. Even if you drop two, you are okay from machine learning AI perspective because all the three are changing with the same proportion, so there is no variance. Across them, there is no variance. They are just changing. So you say, if I have to decide on one, two, three, so why to have one, 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 two, 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 three, three, three? Why not just one, two, three? I put it on a single line and I make it this, so my problem becomes an easier problem to solve rather than just unnecessarily, I have added many features which are just causing our dimensionality to, to increase or grow. Okay, so, so these are like here. Similarly, you can be in 
two dimensional vector so very close to two dimensional vector space so here is an example like for example all the houses or the apartments are four bedroom apartments so this is a dimension which is not adding any value okay everybody has a four bedroom four bedroom four bedroom though you have added it as a feature then you are realizing oh this is not doing any justice to i'm just making a problem complicated because there is no variance in this but thinking about this actually on the data once you have so many features very difficult it's very difficult to just start visualizing seeing doing manually fi finding out so that's why people just go for a dimensionality reduction a feature reduction a feature selection you know so there are many things which happens in machine learning uh, so so that, so here comes the idea of um, spanning and linear independence like if you have three vectors like 111 222 333 if you can represent one three vectors like 111 222 333 3. if you can represent one as a multiple as a, a linear uh, combination of the other so means these three vectors are not independent vectors they are in the same line or they are in the same plane 111 1, multiplied by 2 is 222 <laughs> okay and plus 0 means you can get from 111 you can get 222 and you can get 333 so it means that there is only one independent vector which is 111 okay rest of the two can be derived from this so so means that you have only one dimensional vector space in which you are spanning so it is easy but again you in, in from the mathematics perspective it says if you have three vector it does not mean three dimensional three vector does not mean you are in a three dimensional space if you can represent one vector as a summation of the other two okay it means you are in two dimension if you can represent just both the two as a linear combination of one it means you are in one dimension okay so that's the check people could check that how many independent vectors are there uh, to find out that dimensionality okay there may be you are in 10 dimensional vector space but the variation is such that you can generate all of them from one vector so you are actually in 1d vector space okay if there are two independent vectors you are in 2d vector space so three unless you have the n independent vectors and independence means you cannot find one as a linear combination of the others so then all the vectors are independent there is pointing in different direction and so you are happy okay so linear independence is important to find out that in which dimension you are working once you have data uh, so you that will help you to find out okay and so if you are in a three dimensional vector space and here is a, again a very interesting concept a three dimensional vector space means there are only three vectors which can take you to any point in this three dimensional vector space okay three i j and k a linear combination of i j and k you can point to any point in this whole universe okay so how many points can you have in whole universe infinite many points okay so just a linear combination of i and j and k you can be somebody in this three dimensional space you can the i j k spans the entire universe uh, the physical universe i j k so many go in this direction go in this direction go in this direction you will reach to a point okay so spanning means that there are vectors and why this is interesting like people have actually extended it to i'll show you extended it to faces they say okay i have i j k let's say three faces and i can create every face on this earth for example from these three faces because every face is a, a point in this three dimensional faces and i have the basis if i really can have the basis but if the dimension of the problem is large like the data does not say that it is a three dimensional data so it depends upon the data that you are trying to model that what is the dimension of the data okay and so those are the uh, the number of dimensions means you got to have those many bases to reach to any point so finding bases is also easiest basis is 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 so you have orthogonal bases okay so orthogonal bases is easiest to see that this these are my but bases need not to be orthogonal they could be any three vectors which are independent any three vectors which are independent can span the whole three dimensional space any n dimensional vector which are linearly independent can span the any n dimensional space same is the case with 1d so any one vector 
Okay, its linear combination can span the entire 1D vector spaces. So this is the concept. The span is any set of independent vectors. And what is independent? That one cannot be represented as a linear combination of the others. Okay? Can act as a basis to span the entire space. Okay, to span the, from the AI perspective, from the AI and machine learning perspective, our object exists in this n-dimensional vector space. We are a point. Every sample is a point. Okay? And the classification problem is that you want to group one, and you want to have features such that one is grouped separately, so you can see, oh, this is this group, this is this group, this is this group, so, and you can just partition them, and you say, okay, this, you are done with the classification problem. And modeling problem is, modeling problem is even more interesting problem. Modeling problem is to add more points, add more points into that space, which are not in the real data, okay? If it's a person or a face, so it is not a real face, but because now you have learned the basis, you have learned the space, you can create as many points as you want. Okay? Because every point in this space is a sample. There are few samples that exist, but then there are others, they don't exist. But if you have learned that the, the distribution, then you can generate. So generative AI is this, that, so kind of, a, if, if you look at it in the vector spaces perspective, that every data, real data, what you have is a point. Okay, if I draw this, so here is a three-dimensional vector space. Okay, so you have data which is point this, and 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 point this. So it is distributed in a specific manner depending upon what feature you have, okay? So you learn, uh, you need to learn this distribution so that if you are asked to create more, so you just create in the three-dimensional vector space more points. Those points are following the same distribution so that you say, wow, really this looks like. So in three-dimensional vector space, if they, these are humans, these are dogs, these are cats, these are birds, these are elephants. So you got to, if you are creating a man, you got to get into the space where, which relates to the man. Okay, but if you get to in between, so you will have an elephant which look like a man. Yes, you can do that. You can move from one, one space where you have this set of people to another space where you have another creature and you start moving. And once you start moving, you start creating from man to something in between, something in between and elephant. Okay? And we'll see that, that's, that's how it happens, that you are moving in the space between two points and just changing. And this changes. And one of the, the aspect of Generative AI is that you move these spaces closer together. There is no gap. So, so the thing defines a circle changing into a rectangle or a triangle, going through intermediary shapes, so that you, whatever you generate in between is also interesting. It's not just you say, oh, this ugly looking thing, what it is, and it does not really making sense. So that's something people are just continuously, continuously doing, uh, that all these spaces, they are making them closer together, closer together by just, putting some, so we'll, we'll perhaps get into this as well. So we understand what the spanning set is, what bases are, so you can read through this, I just put some text, but bases are three-dimensional, the best bases for three-dimensional vector space is uh, i, j, and k, okay? And then you can represent any point in the three-dimensional vector space as I've shown you, right? I, I've shown you. But if these points are in a single line, so they are, dependent, they are not independent. So you don't need three-dimensional vector space. Okay, they are dependent, I've told you this. Similarly, in three-dimensional vector space, if you are on a surface, then you really don't need three-dimensional, you need two-dimensional, okay? So the surface becomes uh, your uh, space, subspace, and you, you better exist on the subspace. So these are the, the best bases. The best bases for spanning a three-dimensional vector space is zero, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. X axis, Y axis, Z axis. As I told you, it need not to be right, orthogonal, and this, anything which are independent can be basis, can take you to any point in this space, okay? But this is the best that you have I, J, and K. Also, this is 1D basis is only I, so you can reach to any point in this line by multiplying I with that number. I multiplied by two, I multiplied by minus one, I multiplied by 1.1. .1. Two-dimensional, you have some i and j. So give any value to i, give any value to j, you become a point, okay? And similarly is the plane. And this is the dimensionality reduction thing. 
And let's now, uh, we, we did study uh, PCA, which is principal component analysis. This, this is where the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are going to come in action. That how do you have more insight into the data and its distribution into a space, okay? Like this one. Uh, the, w once we said that, the, the third space is hardly doing anything. So let's systematically remove it, systematically remove the third. Okay, so we're going to see that how uh, we could, could, could do this because, so this is usually uh, a good uh, slide to show that if you look at this, all these points are in three-dimensional vector space, okay, on the left. All these points are in three-dimensional vector space, spread all over the place. But if you think more or closely, you see that there is actually a pattern and the pattern is actually they are here. And there is very little variation on this line. So if, because you're just doing classification, for the sake of simplicity, you say, I can change its value, and let me drop it on this line. And I can change this value, let me drop it. So I just project these on the line. So I reduce the dimension of this problem from 2D to 1D. So first I drop them, then I make the straight lines. I make this line straight. So these becomes like marks on from 0 to 100. Okay? So there is like this dimension, maybe like a, a, a six, seven bedroom and eight bedroom, few. And you say, I think this is just adding a little complexity. I can just have this. So you basically, and again, we cannot manually do this. We need a tool uh, that can do this for us. So I have this line, okay? I then do it like this. So I rotate this, it does not going to change anything as I mentioned earlier, that if you have a one dimensional vector space, it does not matter in which direction it is because it is just a straight line. You could plot it like this, you could plot it like this, it's not going to change anything about the data, about the algorithm, about anything you want to do on that. So you have this line and then you make it this, and then you drop these points on this, so you drop this point here and this point here, and you say I have a 1D problem, and you solve that 1D problem. You can solve it easily, okay? So, uh, so now... There was a question, uh, if you can explain basis functions once again. Yes, I will explain it. This is not the case. Let me explain the basis function. Basis is, uh, in a vector space, let's say this is a 2D vector space, okay? In a two-dimensional vector space, if we have a problem, like I showed you, your weight and height, you're in a two-dimensional vector space. So you weigh some kg and your height is some kg. And you want to see yourself as a point in this two-dimensional vector space, okay? So, so once you start plotting, you plot a point, a point, and point, and point, and point. From linear algebra perspective, you require two vectors to reach to any point in the two-dimensional vector space, a linear combination of two points can take you to any point in two-dimensional vector space. So those two vectors, which should be the simplest vector in the two-dimensional vector space, the simplest vector, they should be your basis, okay? So from me, the base here is this vector, which is one comma zero, which we also call vector i in linear algebra. And the other vector is this vector, which is we also call it j, and which is zero comma comma zero comma one. Okay, zero comma means zero x pe one upper one comma one here zero. And now, if you say my I am three i plus five j. Okay, so I and J are the basis to reach to you by going three in the X direction, five in the Y direction, okay? So I move three here, then I move five in J direction, add these two vectors and I am here where you are. So this is the basis. Basis means that you have two simplest vector by linear combination of these two simplest vector, I can reach to any point in that vector space. So these are called the basis. Okay, they span a vector space. The basis, spanning means that you can get to 
any point in that vector space using. Only I, I cannot. I cannot reach to the second dimension, okay? And similarly, if I have only i, j, I cannot reach k, okay? So, got to be, so the second thing I told you that whatever, whatever matrix you have, it is going to do something with the, whatever matrix you have, it is going to do something with the vector, okay? And sometime intentionally, like in robotics, you have an uh, arm, it's arm, uh, arm effect. So you have a robotic arm, and robotic arm, you only want to move it, rotate it in a direction. Okay, let's just seven. Usually you are solving an inverse kinematic problem. What is an inverse kinematic problem? You are here, you have to pick something from here. So now you need to know that how much you have to rotate the uh, end effector to get to that. So you solve an inverse kinematic problem, and there you find out that this is the angle that you have to actually rotate. So you have a rotation matrix, so you put that, and it will know if it is x and y, so we'll say go this much in x direction, though this much in y direction, you'll reach to that point. So you will lead to the rotation. So, so this is, so every matrix usually is going to do something with the vector. It gets multiplied sometime. Intentionally you want to rotate, intentionally you want a reflection, intentionally you want to do this. So as I mentioned in the start, we are interested in finding out a vector that must not change its direction after it multiplied with a matrix, okay? So this is our objective. Let's see how we are gonna achieve this objective, that, that uh, uh, vector, okay, multiplying with the matrix gives me the vector back, okay? Gives me the vector back. So I have this vector, I multiplied with the matrix, I keep pointing to the same direction. I may, I am allowing to, it to have a different magnitude now, okay? So this is called eigenvalue eigenvector. In sim simplicity, an eigenvector is a vector which is specific to a matrix. So every matrix will have few eigenvectors, okay, eigenvector. So you cannot have any vector which will not change its direction, it's not possible, okay? You cannot have just any vector. So given a matrix, you can only have certain number of vectors which will not change their direction. And, and what is a matrix? Matrix has data, usually. So matrix has uh, your, uh, in machine, from machine learning perspective, what do we have in a matrix? We have, for example, the movie that we are talking about, the recommender system, okay? And we said for every movie, you have a user, you have a user here, this is user number one, okay? This is user number two, and then you have, let's say, one million users, so <laughs> user number, if it is on, on uh, Netflix, so they may have like millions, perhaps billions of users. And uh, here are like, uh, let's say we're just talking about even just one movie. So there is one feature which says what type of movie it is, okay? And then who is the director? Then who are the stars in it? And, and then the other age, what time it was released? And all these are the features, okay? So this is the category of the movie. So you, the column is the category. Okay, then this column is the director and you have to assign a number to the director obviously because it has to be a number. So every column is primarily a, a feature. So for every AI machine learning problem, so you have objects and then you have vectors which are the features, okay, which are the features. And uh, somehow, this is your matrix. One problem with eigenvalues and eigenvectors is they only work on square matrices. And in machine learning, there is hardly any time you get a square matrix, okay? You are never going to get a square matrix because it is not possible that if you have 10 million users, you are going to have 10 million features as well, okay? So usually users are going to be a lot and features are going to be few. So you are never ever going to have a square matrix in almost any AI machine learning, so you are always going to deal with matrices with different dimensions. And usually you have more data points 
and in a deep learning problem, okay, if you're solving it, so you got to have humongous amount of big data, deep learning, generative AI. So you have humongous, humongous amount of data and every data basically primarily has, a sample has several features, okay? So we are going to see that how this uh, eigenvalue, eigenvector becomes relevant because the matrix that you are multiplying has to be a square matrix, okay? So we'll, we'll come to this. So here, so the matrix is, has something to do with the data. At this point, the matrix has to do something with the data. And this is a vector for the principal component analysis. This is the vector which points to where there is maximum variance in the data. The feature, the variance like the sh which I showed you here, here. So this vector you see, this vector which is marked here, this is the principal component of this data. This is where the data is, okay? If I could put a vector here, I can reduce the second dimension. So this is called the principal component, okay? So I have this data, somehow, without really drawing it here, without actually visually seeing it here, I want somehow magically, it figures out that which is the axis where most of the spread is, which will help me to do the classification, where the maximum spread is. What is the axis where there's minimum spread? I should just throw that away, throw that away because it's not helping me out. It's just, just making my problem complex, okay? So principal components are those vectors, okay? So we got to find out these vectors which are going to be the principal components, the principal axis of my new axis which I'm going to then rotate and put them straight like I did it here, right? So the data, the matrix A is basically, what is matrix A? Matrix A is the matrix, the data that we have collected of the samples. If it is a recommender system, all the movies, all the user, if it is about apartments, about all the apartments, their prices, their uh, number of rooms they have. So, so depending on the problem I'm trying, if it's a patient, then all patient record. Basically, this is my matrix A. Right? So my matrix A. I'm trying to find out a vector as a, uh, which should act as a principal component. And obviously, if I'm in an n-dimensional vector space, okay, theoretically, they are going to be n axis. Theoretically, n axis, two-dimensional two. And if I'm lucky, some may not be adding a lot of value into my data. And mostly, some of them would not be adding a lot of value in my data, okay? And it's very difficult. I don't know how somebody thought about all these things. It's very difficult, honestly, to figure out that axis should be here in humongous amount of data and you are good with only, let's say you have 200 vectors and you're only good with three or four. Okay, so you reduce the dimension of the problem to just a three-dimensional, four-dimensional problem, okay? So that's, that's basically the magic of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And whosoever thought it just must be an amazing, amazing person, must be very good. So, but the idea is same, that here is a symmetric uh, matrix transform a vector to a vector in the same direction. So finding that vector is the problem of finding the eigenvector, and the scalar that will only just change the magnitude is the eigenvalue, okay? So here is the problem that you have a matrix A, which has to do something with the data in machine learning problem. You are multiplying with a vector, which ultimately will become your principal component. This vector will be your axis, okay? This vector is going to be your axis which will, uh, once you multiply it with the sum form of the data, will remain as is, will remain as is, and only it will be multiplied with, with lambda, okay? So I'm done with solving the problem of complexity reduction if I can find such a vector for my data, which once you multiply it with the sum form of the data, it remain as is, okay? So it seems like a difficult problem because you could have this vector anywhere you don't know. Right? So this is called the matrix, which is our data, some representation of the data. This is called eigenvector. This is called eigenvalue. And here. So here is the visualization that this is a vector and it remains in the same direction and but only changes the magnitude after multiplying with A. And as I told you, about 99.9% .9 of the time, if you randomly select a matrix and a vector, 
the vector will change its value. It's not going to point in the same direction. It's not possible. Okay? Randomly, you may do hit and trial, and perhaps if you are lucky, you may hit a one which is just not going to change its direction. It's always, always going to change the direction. Okay? So, so the problem mathematically can be easily solved. Like you perhaps might have done it in your engineering course because I'm more into like getting into the concept. But it's really an easy problem because once you say it is, this is the matrix, this is the vector. So if matrix is a, and has to be a square matrix, it's a four by four, so means uh, then your x has to be four by one, okay? So it is a, because it has to be square, so it's four by four, the vector has to be four by one. If it is three by three, your vector has to be three by three by one. So means if you are in a three-dimensional vector space, so your vector will be in the three-dimensional vector space. If it's a two-dimensional vector space, your vector will be in two-dimensional vector space. If it's a one-dimensional vector space, your vector will be in one-dimensional vector space. So you say this is a mathematical relationship. So you bring lambda x on this side, and because a is a vector and you multiply lambda with i, x with i, which is an identity matrix usually, if you don't understand this, it is fine. But i means I one, a vector, uh, a matrix of any dimension, once multiplied with a vector will give you the same vector because it is diagonally one, 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 rest zero, so it will just send it. So putting an i is like multiplying by one. So it does not hurt, okay? So this is your, your vector, this is your matrix, a, b, c, d and you put this matrix here and this minus lambda is only on the diagonal so this is a minus lambda here and d minus lambda here and if this equation is zero so there is a trivial solution for this equation to be zero that is this x is zero but I am not interested in an x which is shunne 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 okay I am not I am interested in something which is non-zero Okay. So for, for that, because I want a principal axis, so I don't want that 0, 0, 0, 0. It's, it's a trivial, we say this is a trivial solution. I don't want to get to a trivial solution. I want to a non-trivial solution where this should be non-zero. So if this is non-zero, then the mathematician says it's determinant to be zero. A determinant has to be zero for this equation to have a non-zero solution. So I say, okay, let's, let's make the determinant of this equal to zero. And determinant, we know how we calculate this multiplied by this minus this multiplied by this is equal to zero, okay? So you write an equation, solve for lambda, lambda gives you the value. So here is an example uh, from the same book, Dr. Stang book. It is on page 36 of Dr. Stang book. He says, this is the matrix 8, 3, 2, 7 is the matrix, okay? So you go through the same exercise, 8 minus lambda, so on diagonal you write minus lambda minus lambda, easier and put it equal to zero. Okay? Matrix remain as is, only the diagonal, wherever there are diagonal elements, you write minus lambda minus lambda and you have this determinant, put the determinant is equal to zero, it make a quadratic equation and the quadratic equation you solve, you get two values. One is 10, the other one is 5. These are called the eigenvalues, they are very important. Okay? It is the character of the data. Okay? The eigenvalues are so looking inside into the data and I'll show you why. Okay? So this 10 means not 10 only. It shows the character of the data in one, in one principal direction. The, the 5 is not 5. It shows the character of the data in another dimension. So the 10 and the 5 are the true character of the data in this two directional space. Okay, if it is a 2D problem that you are solving. So now, because you want to find out the direction of these principal axes, okay, kind of, because I need a vector and I need another vector, which, which are going to buy a new vector, uh, which are going to give more uh, uh, comprehension to the problem that I am trying to solve, and it is data dependent. So I go, I put 10 in this equation, which is this equation, I put 10 here. So for lambda, I put 10. Okay, once I put 10, so I can just solve it. So here is, I put, instead of lambda, I put 10 here, I write 10 here, x1, x2, it is zero and zero, and it becomes a, a, a simple case where I have to assign some value because this is going to be minus two, and I multiply, I have two equations. And for this lambda one, my vector comes out to be three and two. Okay, my vector is three and two. Three in one direction, two in the other direction. And the my second eigenvector comes out to be, for five, it comes out to be 
1 and minus 1. This is the second vector. So, these are the two eigenvectors and these are the two eigenvalues. Okay? So, that is how we calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I have, I have given another example and you can get to this example by clicking here. This is also simple, a two-dimensional, it goes to the same route where you have minus lambda, minus lambda, you have a quadratic equation, you solve that equation, okay, this is equation, you get two values, then these values, you put this back into this equation, you have this equation and this equation, and you simplify the equations, okay, this is minus 12x plus 2y, and then here is uh, minus 4x. So, you don't need to solve it uh, uh, simultaneously, rather uh, you just assign a value of x, anything, you assign x is equal to 1 here, you get y, okay? assign x, you get y. So, for example, is assign uh, x is equal to 1, so y is equal to 4. So, uh, either equation reveals that y is equal to 4x, so the eigenvalue is a non-zero multiple of this, which is 1 and, and 4, these are the eigenvectors. And similarly, I have put another example just for you to basically those of you who want to, I am not interested in solving, but those of you who really, really want to solve a three-dimensional problem. Again, you have minus lambda, minus lambda, minus lambda, then you solve the determinant, find out that now there are going to be three eigenvalues and three eigenvectors. So, you solve for every eigenvalue, there is an eigenvector. So, solve all the eigenvectors. So, here we are. Uh, that we are from the machine learning perspective, I am more interested into principal component analysis, PCA. Right? So, the PCA is where uh, it will figure out where the maximum variance of the data is, which is giving me the maximum information. Something which is constant gives me the minimum information. As I mentioned earlier, if every house in my data has four bedroom, it is not adding any value into my classification. So, I should just throw it out. Okay? So, but if there are like area changing and the, the values changing, so those are the things that I really want to see because that is giving me some value in my AI, my intelligence, which really requires us to have something where there is more variance. And so, for example, so this is how you go. So, you have features as we have seen here are, is a sample and you have feature and a feature and a feature and a feature. And you may have these many features and among this amount of samples that you have and you just plot them into, if it's a 2D, you can visualize, more Ds you cannot visualize. And you are interested in finding, these are the principal components of this data. One here and one here. And that's what you want to find out. What are the principal components? And they are, for a symmetric matrix, they are orthogonal to each other. So they are going to be the basis. Remember, I told you about basis. So they are going to the basis, they are going to primarily span the entire space. Right? So if they are 10 dimensional problem, you reduce it to three dimensional problem, the eigenvectors will be the basis for the three-dimensional problem that using those three components or three eigenvectors, you can reach to any point in now a new three-dimensional space. This is important. The bases are important. The spanning the entire space is important because this is where you live. This is where your data live in, in the dimensionality. That this is where everything is going to live. So, you got to make sure that you can reach to those points so you know your, your bases. The bases are those three or four vectors which are going to take you to any place uh, in that vector space. It, you can span span the entire space using the basis. So spanning is important. If you cannot, it's not possible. So if you don't have correct basis, you will not able to reach some part of the space. So it means you can you may not be able to reach some part of the data, which obviously is absurd. So you want to make sure that you got to have bases and you can span the entire space. So spanning the entire space is important. So principal components find the greatest amount of variance in the original data. Okay. So let me show you this this picture, then I'll come back. Yeah, this is like amazing, amazing picture. Okay. So this eigenvalue has to do with the spread along this axis. So this value is equal to the spread of the values and now you see the value in the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. It's just amazing. So this is the spread in this principal direction and then there is little spread in the other direction. Okay? And you say, wow, it means that eigenvalue, its value actually tells me this is garbage. I should just throw it out. This particular axis, I should just remove it and and removing means you just project all these points from this direction, this dimension, which is this dimension, onto the principal axis dimension and make it a 1D problem. Okay? 
So the value of the lambda is so important. If it is small, it's a 0 0.0034. You say, oh, this is of no use to me. Because in this direction, there is hardly any spread. So this, you throw that dimension out. You say, oh, it is 10. Oh, 10 means a lot, depending upon. You say, no, I really want to keep this. So you now, if you have, let's say, your, uh, your vector space is 100 dimensions, like the word which we were saying, 300 dimensions. A every word was a 300 dimension in the 300 dimension vector space. And we projected it onto a three dimensional vector space. That was more for the visualization. But if you are really doing it for, for uh, uh, the dimensionality reduction, you got to look into the value of lambdas as well. You say, oh, these are the higher values of lambda. So what you do is you find out all the lambdas and then uh, you rank them. And you then say, oh, these I will only keep these and throw the rest of them away. Okay? Throw the rest of them away. So you have now a reduced problem, which you have systematically, logically, you have done it. So the lambdas are so important because, and, the, and obviously the vectors are so important because they're just taking you to another world without actually looking into the data. You can just have a a sense of what your data is telling you. There is, uh, and this is the combination. This is not just a feature. This is all, uh, the second important thing is, we say feature elimination. One is that you say this feature is not adding any value. It is, maybe every feature is adding a value. But it's about their relationship. If your height and weight are the data you have, your height and weight are always, always moving in a, let's say, uh, they have uh, linearly proportional to each other. In the entire data, you have two features, which are linearly proportional to each other. Both are varying. So once you gain one kg of weight, you gain few inches in height. Once you gain this, or you gain in the height, you gain in the weight. You gain in the height, you gain in the weight. And you plot the data, you say, oh, it's a straight line. It means your feature should be height plus weight, or just height should be enough. Your height plus weight, you are right on this line, okay? You say, this is fine, I can have. So this is a combination of features that makes your new feature because it is on this axis, on the 45 degree axis. You say, uh, now I have just one feature which is height plus weight, okay? So you add height, add weight, and you are moving on this line, okay? And this becomes your only feature, and you do the classification here. So means once we say, uh, the dimensionality reduction, it is not that some features you are throwing away. You're not throwing away some features. But you are finding out interesting patterns where one feature, one feature pro directly proportional to another feature or to another feature, to another feature. Then you say, wow, I can have a combination of these to remove my direction. So, so this is important. The lambdas are important that what eigenvalues are going to add. So if we now go back, okay, now comes the, the problem where you have a, a non-symmetric matrix. You know what, eigenvalues you only can calculate of symmetric matrices. So you have a matrix where it is not symmetric at all. Here, okay? So these are, let's say, if you are doing apartment one, apartment two, apartment three, apartment 10,000, okay? This is feature one feature two, feature three, feature four, feature five. And maybe uh, because you don't want to miss anything, usually this is what people do. They don't want to miss anything, okay? They want to miss anything which may be important. So just put everything as to start with. They say, my technique will just remove if there is some redundancy, something is not adding value, why should I be worried? But I don't want to miss anything which is important. So you just throw everything so that you're just collecting everything and you don't spend your mind in figuring out what should be there and what should not be there, okay? You say, I'm just going to put all these things here, okay? So let's say this problem becomes a, a, a 10,000, uh, I'm to ease off my, so some into 11, okay? So this is the size of my matrix now. So for PCA, what you need to compute is a covariance matrix, okay? Covariance matrix is once you multiply this matrix with its transform. Very interesting, okay? So we, we, we are going to keep hitting this matrix again and again. 
So this is a matrix where you have this data, humongous amount of data you have, and, and you, we know that a data is a matrix. Okay? You multiply it with the same matrix, but you take a transpose. So once you take a transpose, what will happen? So if this is n, one matrix is n into m, where m are the features. So m are the features, which are smaller in number, maybe 10, maybe 12, maybe 30, maybe 14, okay? And the features are the dimension as well. So m is the dimension of the vector. And once you take its transpose, it is going to be m into n, right? m into n. So once you multiply them together, what are you going to get? An m n, m into m n, which is a small matrix, which is just a 10 by 10 matrix or a 20. So you are dealing with a very small matrix. Number one, you're not dealing with a 10,000, 1 million by 1 million matrix. This is very important. Though my data is humongous, but I'm not dealing with a 1 million by 1 million matrix, which is almost impossible to handle that you just try to solve a polynomial with 1,000 degrees, finding 1,000 lambdas. So it becomes a very small matrix, number one. So this is something, oh, I really like it. The other one is that the characteristic of this matrix, this is also very important. Once you are multiplying a matrix, uh, which is uh, like this, to a matrix of the same, putting in another dimension, okay? This is a transpose. This is M into 10,000, and this is 10,000 into M. So how do you multiply? You take its first row, which is your feature number one, okay? This is your feature number one, your salary, for example. Salary of everybody in this list, 10,000 people. You say salary, 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 okay? And what is this? The same row, salary, 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 this. So you're multiplying salary with salaries, okay? This is called autocorrelation. You're finding correlation, so you multiply that number, x, x0 square plus x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square, and if you take out the average from it, it actually gives you sigma or the variance, sigma square, okay? So this diagonal is where you have every feature is square, or every feature minus the average is square, and then you are adding the first value, the second, this is the second feature, this is the third feature, this is the fourth feature, this is the fifth feature, and this is the tenth, tenth column, okay? Let's say this column, this column gets multiplied by this column, so it's a same multiplication, element by element multiplication, then addition. It is just every feature you are just squaring and adding them together to have a value which shows that how much is the spread of that. Once you compute what is sigma, sigma is the spread. We'll come to this again. But sigma, if it's sigma is zero, it means the data is, has no spread. The same, same, same value. Because if you are subtracting it from the, the average, and so every, let's say, two, 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 two. So average is two. So two minus two is zero, 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 zero. Zero multiplied, zero square, zero. Adding zero, zero. So it'll remain zero. So an entry which is zero here means that it is the same value in the entire feature, you have the same value. Okay, so it's just the same value means that this feature is otherwise is redundant because it has the same value. But interesting are the other, other things. Once you multiply this first column with the second column, this is called cross correlation. How the first feature relates to the second feature in your data, okay? If this is the salary, this is the tax you pay, this shows whether you are paying taxes which are, corresponds to your Taxes or not, if you say there is a variance, it means that you are not paying the taxes, this is not relating to each other. Or the money that you are spending does not relate to the money you earn, okay? Again, you are going to have more variance. So, so this matrix is a very important matrix. It tells that feature, the diagonal is the feature itself, how spread it is, and the other elements said this feature relating to the other feature in your data, how it relates to the other feature, the other feature, the other feature. So covariance, the covariance is its relationship with the other features in the data, and the diagonal is its relationship with itself, okay? So this is what the matrix that you make. So once you have this matrix, okay, 
then you do the eigenvectors and I have already told you eigenvector, eigenvalues, so you convert it into a uh, and then you decide upon lambdas. You say, all these smaller lambdas, I'm going to throw away this. And I'm going to project my data, and I'll give you an example. This is a very interesting example, okay? So this is where you have this two-dimensional data. It may be millions of entries. It may be millions of entries, okay? So two-dimensional data, millions of entries, maybe houses. It's price and covered area, for example. End of the day, once you find out a matrix, it becomes a two-by-two two matrix, okay? Because there are only two features. So you say, okay, there are two features, so you have only two by two matrix, okay? So you are going to have two eigenvectors and two eigenvalues because it's not about the amount of data you have, but it is about the amount of features you have, okay? So you say, okay, so you, let's say your one eigenvalue is this and the other eigenvalue is this. What does it tell you? 0 0.0490832, you say, I should just throw it away. I should just throw this away because it's not really adding any value to me. This is important. Okay, so I am going to keep only lambda one. This vector, I am going to be on this. Okay, whatever. Uh, now its direction is 0.6778 and 0.735. It is in this direction, this vector. So it is not that a feature is redundant, but apparently there seems to be a relationship, a strong rela linear relationship between the two features. You say such a strong relationship between the two features, I should just keep one feature which is 0.6778 of one plus 0.7357 of the other, okay? So I'm going to keep this. And so you say, okay, uh, so these are my first eigenvector. This is my second eigenvector. I say, I'm going to discard this axis altogether. I'm going to throw away this axis. I'm going to make this a 1D problem. And once you throw away this, you have only this. And now all the points in your space, you are going to project it on this line. How do you project? This is so simple. That you have this, this, this feature vector, okay? So this is your original data set, which is two, di two dimensional vector. It may be two into 10,000. And this is your feature vector, which is this, a, a two into one. So you take its transpose, it becomes one into two. And this is two into 1,000. So every point, you basically multiply. So as I mentioned, first, first value with this, and second, for example, if it is price and covered area, price multiplied by 0.678, and covered area multiplied by 0 0.735, this becomes my new feature. So now I have, I'm in one direction. I have only one feature, which is a combination of two features, but I am in now 1D space, 1D vector space, and I have reduced my problem from 2D to 1D. But interesting is once you have a, an N which is quite large, quite big, and then you see that how much you can actually reduce, okay? So this is, this is precisely, precisely, yeah. Oh, sorry, I could not stop. So, so this is like vectors, 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 vectors. You see the variance, the projection on the line and eigen, eigen vector is just going to give you, if I can stop, sorry, I have to, yeah, now I can stop it here. Uh, yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Perhaps I cannot stop it, but I, there was a way to stop this. It's a video actually, so let me see if I can. Perhaps not. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nee. Ah, yeah. Jeff, I. Like, look, Bahra. So we know where the pink line is. That is the. Uh, the eigen for this this problem. This is the vector. We say, I'm I'm happy with this. So uh, now let's move to the. Uh, it's in a very uh, interesting and because of its uh, primarily uh, the name the eigen faces. This became a very very famous paper, and you will find a lot about this eigen faces. Okay. It's not a vector, and we'll say that oh, it's a vector, but the vector is actually a face. <laughs> okay, and uh, we will see how a vector can be a face. Okay, but this vector, the eigen vector, is actually a face. Okay, uh, and because it's a linear, linear uh, combination of these vectors, which can just take you. So these are the basis vectors, so to say. So 
So it can do the face detection means finding out where the face is and uh, maybe Dr. Yasser is here, he, he may just will be demoing you something if, if we find time today. But then is the face recognition and verification problem where uh, face verification is like in your mobile phone, it checks whether it is you who is just downloading something, especially from App Store. Uh, or recognition means anybody like Facebook would just name uh, all the faces, it will basically recognize. It'll say, this is this, this is, if you want to tag anybody, so you can tag that. So this is, we know. So here is uh, an interesting, and there are many, many applications of eigenvalues and eigenvalues, many, many, especially in AI and machine learning, okay? So many applications. But this is uh, a fascinating application. It's fascinating because they tried like uh, on 1,000 faces. Okay? Interestingly, I could generate it on ChatGPT also, <laughs> the same application by just giving a prompt, it'll just generate the code for you. So here are 1,000 faces, okay? So these are the 1,000 faces. It's a, it's a database and you can access to this database as well, okay? So, so, you, so there are like 10,000 faces and uh, you add all of them together. <coughs> all of them together and divide by, if they are 1,000 faces, divide by 1,000. So this becomes the average face. It still looks like a face. But this is the average of all the faces in the database. It's, it's the mean face. Okay, not mean, mean. It is <laughs> the, the mean face, the average face. Okay, and you can't even tell whether it is a woman, a male or a female, but it is a mean face, okay. So now what you do is, once you are going to find out the eigenvector and eigenvalues of this, you convert every image in the database or the training set that you have into a one-dimensional vector. So it becomes a feature, okay? Like you have a feature, uh, which is the price of the apartment, okay? So, but it is going to have n square values. It means there are n square samples, okay? So this is a vector, which is one of the feature vector, okay? Which has how many values? N square values. Depending upon the N, if it is 100 by 100 image, so it is 100 by 100, okay? So it is 10,000 values. This is one feature, then you have another, then you have another, then you have another, then you have another, then you have another. So, you, so this is your image, and you convert it into a vector, N square by one. And this vector, you can convert it back into an image. By how? By just arranging the first n in the first row, then the second row, then the third row. So it means from vector, you can go to image. From image, you can come to vector. It is hardly a, anything that you need to do, okay? Because it is, this vector is actually an image. So once you will have a eigenvector, it will actually be an image. Because to do is take that vector and put it and display it in an image form, right? So, so this is your eigen. Uh, you're just a vector, uh, a feature vector in your uh, uh, data set, and you subtract it from the mean. Mean face, like because you want to find out the variance that how each feature varies from the, the mean. So, so take this, subtract it from the mean face, and then put it in an array, and this is your minus the mean, and uh, and what we want to do this, we want to do something which is really very crazy thing, that we want to find out few faces, maybe 10, maybe 20, few eigen faces, and I will try to generate all 10,000 faces with a linear combination of those 10 faces. It's a very crazy thing. Like the concept is the spanning a uh, space. Once I, J, K, and, and this is the claim, once i, j, k can get you to this any point in this three-dimensional space, i, j, k can take you to any point, this many i, these many j, and these many k, and you can touch any point in the universe, okay? So the claim is that any 10 faces, the bases, can take you to the any face on this earth maybe, but at least in the database. So this is the claim, okay? So, so that's how they started. Somebody, it was the MIT Media Lab, so there was like a few people in MIT Media Lab. They have this crazy idea that let's try to find out few faces with the linear combination of those faces can create any face, right? So that's how they started. 
And they say, then you will have W1, W2, WK. If these are 10, so everybody is, is only, so my face is only this, these 10 numbers in this 10 dimensional vector space. So every one of us has these unique 10 numbers which represents us in this 10 dimensional vector space. If I say only three faces, or I say only two faces, very interesting, only two dimensions. So only two faces, I want to generate every face. It'll be ugly looking face, but still you will be a point in a two, direct, two dimensional vector space. If a three, you will be a point in a three dimensional vector space. So the idea is very simple, okay? So I said, let's find out the eigen faces, which are going to be the basis of a space, right? So these are the top eigenvectors. Remember lambdas? He says, okay, I have, let's say, like it's 1,000. So let's say I have 1,000 eigenvalues. But it says, I am only going to use uh, a lambda. With every lambda, there is a vector. Because remember, every lambda, there is a vector, okay? You say, this lambda is, and then you rank it. So high, highest value of lambda is your first eigenphase. So this has the highest eigenvalue, okay? This is the second, this is the third, this is the fourth. Okay, so this is your uh, eigenfaces. A linear combination of these is going to create any face. Looks crazy thing, but this is what they basically, mathematically they proved it. And then with experimentation, they said, okay, look, we are actually creating any face with a linear combination of this. Now it means multiple things. One thing is that a face recognition becomes very simple because I know where I exist in this, in this space, okay? If I put my face and they again find out, which is very simple, a vector can be projected to these eigenfaces and find out those 10 numbers and they only have to compare that how close I am from those 10 numbers. They say yes, because it's a point and I have now the new, new face and I am again a point. And they've calculated the distance. So, yeah, it seems like this person. It does not have this person. And also, whether it is a person or it's a cat or a dog, <laughs> I say, oh, there's a large distance between any of these, so it seems that it is not even a person, it is something else, okay? So these are the eigen faces, which are actually the eigenvector, n square, and then placed like this, n square, eigenve uh, eigenvector of dimension n square, okay? So this is how they claim that they generate these numbers, 10 numbers. How that this is you, a new of you, now you have trained this network. So, so you have these databases, you train them, they have eigenfaces, and now you go in front of the camera, you say, okay, this is who I am, tell me who I am, and who I resemble to in the database, closest to, okay? So all it is going to do is take me, subtract me from the mean, the mean face, because that is how we actually created data. So I now take a new of me, and I subtract it from the mu, and this, these are my eigenfaces, UIT, UKT. I just, with the transpose, I multiply, okay? Because let's say this is 10,000 into one. So it becomes one into 10,000 because I'm taking the transpose. And this is also 10,000 into one. So one into 10,000 multiplied by 10,000 into one becomes one into one becomes one number, okay? So this is a number, which is my weight that weight, I have the resemblance with the first eigenphase, the i direction I move. The second one is the j direction I move. The third one is the k direction I move. So I become a point in this vector space and then I find out who my neighbors are, who my closest neighbor is. And with my closest neighbor, I say this seems like this person, okay? And so that's, that's simple it is. And here you see, this is the mu that I subtracted and then I can add it back to get to my face. So this is W1 is a constant multiplied by the first eigenphase. W2 is a constant multiplied by the second eigenphase. So I put all these and I become I. But not I, my picture, but I from the eigenfaces. So, now I say, oh, do I look like I? I say, yeah, I think I look like I. And because of the basis, the spanning, the vector spaces, the eigenvalues, the eigenvectors, and I say, woo, yeah, it works, okay. So these are, 
so so there are like five thousand five ten one thousand images and they have only 50 eigenfaces 50 dimension eigenfaces okay from a combination of 50 the claim is they can generate all 1000 faces okay so this is uh, having only 50 eigenfaces they have generated this okay and now this is showing what if you have 100 eigenfaces obviously you are going to improve what if i have 250 eigenfaces obviously you are going to improve what if i have all the eigenfaces a thousand of them definitely uh, you should get to the original original one so so this is the math. I perhaps I'll quickly go, but you need not to understand this. Okay, I mean, don't spend too much time. If somebody really, really want to in this area, then perhaps yes. But it's very simple. This is something what we have already done. Finding the average. So we already know that this is uh, tau i is an image, a face in the database. And I select, let's say 50. I want to have 50 of the eigenfaces. So, or the training, I may have all of them. So, I do 50, I randomly select 50 images, I get their average. So, this becomes the mean. So, I t then I subtract this mean from every image. So, I get a new image, which is the image minus the mean. So, mean say, we subtract it. So, we have like zeroed every. So, it is from the zero, we, I have now this image. And this is the correlation that you do, okay? So you are uh, having uh, this correlation and, uh, uh, and you have this matrix. Actually, we should start from here, okay? So you have these images and this is where it makes it a computationally very intensive problem. So this is my first image, n square. This is my second image, n square. And this is my kth image, n square and number of points are n square. So n square is an image, n square is an image, n square is an image, and I have k's of, k's of these images. And I take this multiplied by this. Interestingly, it becomes a, a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, and which is very difficult. So because ideally, they are going to be 10,000 eigen, because these are the number of eigen vectors. It becomes a big problem. And so it says, uh, no, I'm going to solve a simpler problem, not this problem, uh, rather a simple problem, not this problem, rather a simple problem. And they solve this problem, which is they multiply it with the, let me show you, yeah. They solve this problem. They multiply this with A to reduce the dimensionality. So then this thing becomes an eigenvector, uh, which is uh, a face, but let's not get into uh, these because I don't want to just, but I have put everything in the slide so that you can understand. If there is anybody who wants to really, really get into this, we, we can just spend more time. But here is a face is just 10 numbers. A face may be just two numbers as well. Just the first, you are using the first two eigenfaces, then it becomes a two dimensional face. So here is an example, okay? A very interesting example. What they have done is they have actually now plotted it every face in a two dimensional space, okay? A W1 and W2, just two eigenfaces, and they have found the, what is the uh, projection of a face on this. So every face is a two dimensional. And they figured out that the faces in green, and the faces in blue, and the faces in red, they have some peculiarity, like either they are white people, or they are black people, or they are this people. So means even at this granularity where a complete face, which is 64 by 64 bit, if you project it to just a point, just two numbers, still it has some character in it, okay? So it means that it can solve some of the classification problem by reducing a face to just a point in two dimensional space. And a point, a face could be a point in a three dimensional space, but a face from this perspective is always going to be a point in some dimensional space. So, so then I even today I find out, so this is the algorithm that I have again written so that anybody who is interested in the complete algorithm, but this is interesting. Then I thought that perhaps chat GPT will have problem in generating this. This is the prompt I gave to chat GPT. I said, generate Python code that takes eight samples of face images, find eigenfaces, 
and generate the faces again from first four eigen faces. I said these are the eight faces, but regenerate all the faces with just four eigen faces. Okay, so it actually generated the code, and there was an error. I gave that error back to Chat GPT. It said, "Sorry, let, let me fix it," and then it fixed it. Okay, so fixed it, but because it's a computationally an intensive problem, so apparently it reduced it to a very very small size. Okay, so all these are the faces. If you look at these. These are actually, this is the reconstructed face. I think it's 8 by 8. I'm, I'm just imagining it's 8 by 8. I ask it, no, just increase the uh, dimension of the resolution of the images, then it took forever. It was just uh, working, working, working. So apparently, uh, but it did, did actually generate something. Uh, this is what I wanted you to try. That try this out. Okay, so there is a, a library of faces. You don't need to even input anything. I'll say I'm going to take these 10 images from this library or these 20 images or 100 images from this library. I'll just generate this for you. Okay, so then is, uh, okay. So still you can find people uh, using, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like here is a paper which is very recent where it is saying cutting tool condition monitoring using eigenfaces. So what, he, it, what this paper has done is they have this picture of the cutting tool and then they have these eigenfaces and it finds out the linear combination and check the quality of the tool by having this, the condition of the tool, the current picture in this three-dimensional vector space. Okay? whether it requires to be removed or, you know, this is an interesting work that people are still doing, using eigenfaces to replace an image with a point in a vector space, and then doing the classification problem, then doing the recognition problem, then doing the detection problem, okay? So making the problem reduced to a point, making a picture reduced to a point, and then plotting the point in an n-dimensional space, and then checking whether you can classify I do the classification or not. It's very, very interesting. And this is another thing which I, I, I basically studied that this phase, they started changing the weight. One weight, then another weight, another weight. And these weights, like they're 10 weights, so they replace one first of his, this person, then the second weight, then the third weight, then the fourth weight. And once you replace all the 10 weights, this guy will become this guy definitely because th this is what it is. Means that you can actually traverse this space going from one phase to another by slowly changing these numbers, these 10 constants, and you will see the changes in the phase and become another phase. Changing in the phase and it becomes another phase because that these are the eigenfaces that are adding together, giving you a face. Right? So the second thing which I want to do today is uh, 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 the, the coming, now we have been just focusing on primarily on the data representation. Now I want to move towards the models that remember uh, that this is how we define uh, AI, that it is the problems that requires thinking, perception, and action, and to create models that can basically do that. So, uh, perhaps this is very interesting. There is nothing certain in this life but the uncertain or the uncertainty. That is the only certain thing that the uncertainty is in life. And the next is uh, how to cope with uncertainty in life. Anybody has answer to this problem. How to cope with uncertainty in life? I have an answer to this. <laughs> learn, learn AI. <laughs> okay. So let's just, I, today I, Ali, if you can help me a second. Today I want to run an experiment. I don't know what the result is going to be, okay? So this is, we are going to play a little Ludo game, okay? So this is a souvenir that you can just take it home as well. <laughs> so, so there's a dice, so which you have to roll, and there are coins that you need to flip, okay? Okay, so you, the dice you roll once, and you throw a coin and see whether you get a head or a tail. Okay? So everybody in the class, let's, let's run this experiment. Let's see what we get. Okay? So anybody who gets uh, a head and a six, a head and a six, will, will be the winner. Okay? 
but but no cheating you got to just <laughs> roll the dice and so we have how many 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 so पाकिस्तान इंडिया में टॉस किसने जीता आज आए चले सो दिस इज एन अनसर ब्रेक खत्म थोड़ा सा लेट शुरू किया था अभी ब्रेक कर लेते हैं थोड़ी बस ये लेट्स लेट्स डू दिस एक्सपेरिमेंट और फिर हम थोड़ा ब्रेक कर लेते हैं इसके हम थोड़े आई एम क्वाइन भी मिल गया बाकी किसी को दो दो भी दे दे यार कोई बात नहीं है क्वाइन को टॉस करना है और डाइस को रोल करना है आपको ठीक है सो सही तरीके से यू गो टू रोल द डाइस एंड एक दफ़ा करना है बस ठीक है और क्वाइन को भी तो और बस ठीक है जिसका जो आ गया और जो उसको तो इन लोगों को भी देना जो पीछे बैठे हैं बस बस एक दफ़ा करना है एक दफा करना है जब मैं कहूंगा चले अभी दोबारा से जब वन से आज क्यों तो यू वी आर गोइंग टू आप भी दोबारा से यू आर गोइंग टू रोल द डाइस एंड जाए बाकी लोग भी कर लें जरा सबके पास आ जाए ओके जी नाउ रोल द डाइस एक किस किसके पास आया एक किसके पास वन किसके पास आया एक दो तीन के पास आया कोई लिख सकता है थ्री गॉट वन दो किसके पास आए टू वन के पास टू आया और थ्री किसके पास आया एक के पास थ्री आया फोर किसके पास आया एक के पास फोर आया फाइव किसके पास आया वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव और सिक्स किसके पास आया एक दो तीन चार चार के पास सिक्स आया हेड कितनों के पास आया टॉस किया टॉस टॉस तक कोई नहीं इसमें हेड कितनों के पास आया वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन और टेल कितनों के पास आया वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन 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 अच्छा हेड आया फाइव एट सेवन एट सेवन अच्छा सो वन और हेड किसके पास आया वन एंड हेड दो लोगों के वन भी आया हेड भी आया सो टू और वन और टेल कितने लोगों के पास आया एक सो so, इस जगह पे लेट मी जस्ट राइट इट डाउन सो वन एंड हेड दो लोगों के पास आया एन वन एंड टेल एक बंदों के पास आया टू एंड हेड कितने लोगों के पास आया वन और टू एंड टेल कितने लोगों के पास आया जीरो थ्री एंड हेड कितने लोगों के पास आया थ्री एंड टेल कितने लोगों के पास आया वन फोर एंड हेड कितने लोगों के पास आया फोर एंड हेड कितने पास आया फोर एंड टेल कितने लोगों के पास आया वन फाइव एंड हेड कितनों के पास आया फाइव एंड हेड तीन लोगों के पास आया और फाइव एंड टेल कितनों के पास आया दो लोगों के पास आया अच्छा जी सिक्स एंड सिक्स एंड हेड कितने लोगों के पास आया सिक्स एंड हेड एक दो तीन के पास आया एंड सिक्स एंड टेल कितनों के पास है एक के पास है ठीक है लेट्स डू दिस एक्सपेरिमेंट अगेन एक दफा और करते हैं क्योंकि हमारे पास सैम्पल स्पेस थोड़ी कम है तो लेट्स डू दिस अगेन एक दफा करना है बस एक दफा बस हो गया <laughs> अच्छा अब मैं दोबारा हो गया सर ओके एंड एंड यू आर गोइंग टू स्लिप अक्वाइन एज ओके वन एंड हेड कितने लोगों के पास आया एक के पास आया वन एंड टेल तीन के पास आया टू एंड हेड कितने लोगों के पास आया टू एंड टेल कितने पास थ्री एंड हेड थ्री एंड टेल थ्री एंड टेल आया दो लोगों के पास 
और फोर एंड हेड कितने लोगों के पास है वन और फोर एंड टेल कितने लोगों के पास है वन टू थ्री फोर और फाइव एंड हेड नहीं आया फाइव एंड टेल किसी के पास है सिक्स एंड हेड एक दो तीन चार ये कोई धांधली कर रहे हो तुम सिक्स एंड टेल कौन के पास है अच्छा ठीक है जी सो दिस इज द द गेम ऑफ लाइक लक द प्रोबेबिलिटी हाउ मेनी पॉसिबल आउटकम्स आ दिया वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन एट नाइन टेन अलेवन ट्वेल्व देर आर ट्वेल्व आउटकम्स ठीक है सो दे आर ट्वेल्व आउटकम्स इफ एवरी वन इज इक्वली लाइकली हर एक अगर इक्वली लाइकली हो बिकॉज रैंडम है अगर इफ द द डाइस यू आर थ्रोइंग इज अ फेयर डाइस एंड अ कॉइन इज अ फेयर कॉइन सो दे आर ट्वेल्व पॉसिबिलिटीज ठीक है सो द चांसेस के आपके पास ये आएगा अगर आप वन बाई ट्वेल्व है वन बाई ट्वेल्व है वन बाई ट्वेल्व है वन बाई ट्वेल्व वन बाई ट्वेल्व दिस इज द चांसेज दैट यू आर गोइंग टू हैव अगर हम चौबीस लोग हों अगर वी आर ट्वेंटी फोर पीपल तो हर एक का जो चांस है वो दो 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 आने का है अगर इफ़ यू रिपीट दिस एक्सपेरिमेंट एंड कीप रिपीटिंग दिस एंड दिस इज वट इज़ गोइंग टू हैपन दैट यू आर गोइंग टू हैव अ प्रॉबिबिलिटी ऑफ दिस हैपनिंग एज वन ओवर ट्वेल्व ओके नाउ बिकॉज हम कितने लोग हैं तकरीबन हमने कोई पंद्रह लोगों के तीस तीस लोगों ने शायद ये एक्सपेरिमेंट किया दो जमा ये इसको हम ऐड भी कर सकते हैं सो थ्री फोर दिस थ्री एंड फोर ये सेवन आया ये सिर्फ एक दफ़ा आया ये थ्री टाइम आया ठीक है और ये फाइव सिक्स टाइम आया और ये फाइव फाइव टाइम आया और ये नाइन टाइम आया ये हमारी प्रोबेबिलिटी डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन मैंने हेड देखते हैं कितनी दफ़ा आया ठीक है दो जमा तीन चार पाँच छः सात आठ नौ दस ग्यारह बारह तेरह सोलह सिक्सटीन टाइम्स आया हेड वन टू दो चार सिक्सटीन टाइम्स आया हेड आया एग्जैक्टली सिक्सटीन टाइम हेड आया एग्जैक्टली टाइम टेल आया बिकॉज फॉर हेड एंड टेल दिस इज एनफ ऑफ एक्सपेरिमेंटेशन दैट वी हैव डन इट यू नो about 35 36 time for the dice it is not enough of experimentation that we see the same thing but if we do it many times definitely we are going to see the same thing that the probability of happening one is 1 over 6 2 is 1 over 6 3 is 1 over 6 4 is 1 over 6 5 is 1 over so every probability of happening every number if we have enough of experimentation is the same like we saw here that tossing a coin has 50% probability of head 50% probability of tail ओके okay? इसमें और हम डाल देते हैं मसन इफ ऑलवेज आई से हेड 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 ओके डेफिनेटली आई एम गोइंग टू विन 50 परसेंट ऑफ द टाइम बट इफ यू स्टार्ट गेसिंग माई सेल्फ ठीक है सो देन यू डोंट नो बिकॉज हो तो जिसने पाकिस्तान हमेशा टॉस हारता है इंडिया के साथ ना हर मैच में सो बिकॉज ही इज ऑल्सो गेसिंग बट इज ऑलवेज सेज आई से हेड तो ही कैन एटलीस्ट विन हाफ ऑफ द टाइम फॉर श्योर ऑलमोस्ट सो सो द पॉइंट इज हियर वंस वी सेट दैट the life is uncertain yes life is uncertain anything we do in life is uncertain so what your kids are going to do if you have a business how much business you are going to get you know if you have uh, uh, a restaurant how many customers are going to come to eat this and what are they going to eat so everything is uncertain in life and there are people who can basically figure this out as for a simple case of tossing a coin and throwing a dice i could figure out that half of the time you know i'm going to win half of the time i'm going to lose and one six i'm going to have one because the problem the, the the space is bigger so my probability of getting a six is only 1 over 6 and head is 1 over 12 because now i have added another variable if i add another variable into this the probability is going to reduce but if somehow i have the capacity and capability to to study the uncertainty i can succeed in life and that's what the the, the successful people are those who could read the uncertainties theek hai koi property dealer hai he would say this is going to go up i know you know because you know it's not the gut feeling but he has all the requisite information knowing that this is what will happen this is what will happen it's all uncertainties but people who could actually read through the uncertainties read through the probabilities they can be successful in life and ai just gives you that 
the ability to model an uncertainty, to know your chances of winning, to know that this is how the, the sample space in which you are, this is how it behaves. Okay? See, the only way to study uncertainty is through the probability okay? or, or through the modeling because everything is uncertain in life. Okay? Everything is uncertain in life. But one way is that you close your eyes, you say, everything is uncertain, I don't know. You know? But the other thing is you try to understand, try to study, try to analyze the uncertainty. And it is very simple. That's what we are going to learn in, in, in the second part now that the model then can model the uncertainties. And modeling the uncertainties mean you can guess better, you can make a good decision because now you have studied the uncertainties. So after three minutes, let's, we'll do a break. But uh, so, so now we are going to focus models that are targeted at problems involving thinking, perception, and action. So how the real life works is that there's a real world out there. Okay, there are patients coming to hospitals, the patients going to a restaurants, okay, the people going to vote, uh, and, and you're sitting in an exam, and this is, this is whether it is going to rain or not. So it's a real world, and we are continuously collecting data from this real world. This is what is happening. Like, there are ways, and it used not to be there, but because of all this internet, they know how people talk to each other, how people comment on things. So, Lot of get, lot of collection of data is happening, okay, and that's why they say the data is real gold uh, of this age. Because why? Because you can model and you can basically study the uncertainties and you can take right decisions at right time. So it is the data that you are collecting all the time. So data is a must in order to make a model. You cannot make a model unless you have enough amount of data uh, to basically model an uncertainty. Okay, so you have this model. And from the statistics of the data, the way it varies, like I did, I collected some data, okay? And if I have more time, I can get this exercise done by 10,000 people, for example. So I collect more amount of data. Here, I know that every event is equally probable of one and two, so, so I have some initial belief on the experiment we did. And many a times you don't have an initial belief. You got to, you, you can only make a hypothesis, you can only, you can only say, oh, 10% of the people have COVID. Uh, this is my guess in Pakistan. They are, they are telling a lie. This my, my belief is there are 10% people who have COVID and they are not really reporting this. So this is your initial hypothesis. But only once you start collecting data, you can refine your hypothesis, whether it is really 10% or 2% or 20%. So collection of data is important and only the data will give you the real evidence which will go against the That's why base is the guy who basically proposed a framework where you can have any initial hypothesis, okay? a priori. You say, this is my belief. This person has committed you know, this murder. So this is my initial hypothesis. Then you start collecting data. As you start collecting data, you start getting evidences. And then either it is against your hypothesis whether this person is actual is the murderer, or it starts strengthening your hypothesis and you assigning a different percentage to a hypothesis because here, it is not an it is not a equally likely you know or it is a, a, a probability or a, a chance which you really really don't know. It has to come from the data, and only then you can say. Same is the case with COVID. Same is the case with so many other things where you have to have an initial hypothesis, and then based on the data and the evidence, you got to refine your hypothesis, and then you got to create a model. Okay, so that's the important thing that you create a model. Model will help you to go back to the real world and tell that, oh, I am going to take a good decision. I am going to have prediction into the future because I think I can do that, okay? I can do that because I understood what the model is, what the data is telling. I can bet on this, okay? I, can, I cannot bet anybody getting a six and a head, okay? Because I know it is only one twelfth probability of me winning. If somebody says, you give me 10 rupees, I'll give you 100 rupees, okay? I'll not bet perhaps, you know, because I know that still I'll, I'm losing. So, and then the most interesting thing which is happening now is once you have a model, you can generate new data. That's the generative AI. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, so the modeling uh, becomes important and the modeling as shown, uh, you got to have data and usually humongous amount of data to find the underneath uh, patterns and distributions 
and only then you could have a good model. And if you have a good model, you can generate more data. So the uh, probability primarily is the uh, framework for uh, dealing with the uncertainties because it gives you a rules for consistent reasoning and you can use it for prediction and decisions and you can also generate new samples. So the idea is simple that you have data and from the data uh, you got to uh, create models okay and you got to check whether uh, that model basically can is uh, truly representing data or not and this is uh, once uh, you are done with the model you can throw away the data now you no more need that data that has helped you to generate the models so you have the models and if you want to, uh, based on the models, you can get new input, make decisions, generate new samples. Uh, so then you can generate uh, more examples. So the probability extracting the probability distribution is important from the data. And this is, you know, why people are into generative AI, why people are into probabilities, because though we think that there are uncertainties, but really once you increase the granularity, you move a little up, and then you realize there is no uncertainty. There is usually a distribution. And this is amazing. And I usually say that uh, this is amazing to find out that every year the number of people who die with accidents in Pakistan, they are almost constant. So the same number of people are going to die, you know, from accidents or from heart attack or from, you know, just, and I am in the board of Shifa International Hospital. It amazes me that the patients who are coming with a heart attack and they die with the heart failure, it's almost the same, okay? And the places, the place where you have more probability of getting an accident, they are also known. For example, in motorway, we know where, <laughs> where you get maximum accidents. It is on Kallar Kahar, okay? So means, they, so, so, so though there are certainties, but there is a pattern in those uncertainties as well. Okay, and once you have a lot of data, you can see those patterns like the toss we did, like the dice we threw. If you have more data, you start seeing the pattern. You say, oh, there is nothing random actually. It's all can be known to you that this is what is going to happen. Okay, for example, uh, so many natural phenomena like this is the distribution of newborn babies weight, okay. Maybe a specific baby, you don't know that how much way he is or she is going, the baby is going to have. But once you have 1000 of these, you can know that 10 will be of this weight, 20 will be of this weight, 30 will be of this weight. Okay. So because it is in nature, the, this distribution is in nature. That's why it's called natural distribution or Gaussian distribution. So you can kind of increase at, at a planning level, at a decision making level. Okay, you are not dealing with individuals, you are dealing with the population. And there you can exactly know that this is really what is happening. And if this is what is happening, then what can I do to basically improve upon things? If there are so many accidents, and this is the place where an accident happens the most, and this is, these are the places, these are the hotspots, what can I do about them? Okay? So then you can basically go back to the real world and say, hey, I know now what is happening and I can fix it, okay? And that's why the, the, the modern, the advanced countries have done. Okay. So, so there is a distribution and I myself was amazed that once I started like searching for this, like this is the weight of newborn baby. So average weight is let's say 7.75 and we shall be studying that, okay, this is the, the spread. Mostly uh, one standard deviation away, okay? You have like 68% of the population mostly and two standard deviation away, you have 95% of the population. And three standard deviation away, you have 99.7% of the population. And this is where I, the, the, the figure which I showed you earlier, that you have real data, you do the statistics. Statistics will help you to compute the mean and the variance. And on the variance, you know everything. Just two numbers, just two numbers can just tell you everything. The entire story of what is happening or what is going to happen. That's amazing. That just two numbers, which is just the mean and the standard deviation can tell you exactly, almost exactly that this is what is going to happen to this particular phenomena which you are studying. So this is what I was mentioning. Like this is every year, this is going to be the same. 
okay it's 2009 then 2010 then 2011 then 2012 the little change in the in in the weight and the standard deviation little and okay then you say even if you go and have uh, uh, american black a foreign black a white still the same distribution okay no matter whether a person is a black or a white or asian or you still have a baby which is going to basically follow the same distribution same is then with everything that is happening which we think is uncertainty basically is not uncertainty there's no no chaos in this universe okay so there is no chaos in this universe there are distributions in this universe and the distribution can be learned and this is what generative ai is doing it is just learning the distribution and just doing the amazing amazing things because distributions can be learned if something is chaotic then it'll be just chaotic that you cannot just plot it like this every year you find oh wow this is the same okay so this is the diameter of the head again the distribution this is the uh, the length and the width of the foot okay again has distribute the same distribution and now the people who know this and they are in to shoe manufacturing they know how many shoes of one size they should make okay because if let's say it is uh, i think say uk number or us number 15 size you nobody is going to wear that shoe okay if it is 14 the very little population who who can just use your so mostly you will not find these odd sizes here in even pakistan people don't want to invest and you you find what what is where there is 68% of the population so any business you are doing and you have learned the distribution then you know where to invest okay we are not to take risk that this may you not find person coming and buying your shoe so you go for here there's a huge big market out here why to worry about this and this let some other person worry about this <laughs> maybe a shoe maker who can make a special shoe to worry about this okay because hardly any people you don't want to have anything in your everything in your inventory because there are not many people who are going to come and if you have a restaurant you know that people are not coming asking for this dish why to just bother having this or you know so this is just amazing like this is same the uh, the f- male and female they have a little uh, split a little difference but still they are the same distribution means you can if you're running a business you can make good decisions if you know that this is how my data is distributed and even the intellect so don't assume that everybody is intelligent okay <laughs> they are dumb people in this world as well you got to deal with them as well okay so the it's also intellect is also amazingly uh normally distributed they are very very smart people they are very few ji like no it is not so because there are not surprises there are many factors if you can factor all of them in yes then you can make a distribution but perhaps uh, people any phenomena where people could actually capture all the factors which are affecting that for example whether people have studied a lot and now they can precisely tell okay this is what what are all the factors and it's going to happen but they are still phenomena for example earthquake they have not still really understand that what happens once an earthquake comes can they can they measure those things that are changing and makes the earthquake to happens so it's about more insight into uh, for example i we developed a, a bitcoin predictor which do high frequency trading and but then people are still studying that what are the factors which changes the bitcoin to uh, uh, basically go from up and down and even a tweet from elon musk for example can affect the price of a bitcoin so got to factor that in what social media is saying is there any news about bitcoin is there any regulation is there this is there this so external factors becomes important that if you can factor everything in and then definitely you can basically model it and that's what the the generative ai big data this is what it tries to do and especially the cnn the deep learning that you don't worry about the factors just throw the data and let the let the model itself figure out what are the factors which are affecting but in some cases because they have studied it so much okay so they know that this is really the intellect and that's what all these tests act scores they try to make scores to make sure that they can basically map people on their genuine position in this intellectual curve and i always say a good teacher is also somebody who can actually create this curve from the students who are taking the course always going to be gaussian if there is a teacher who says everybody is 80 to 90 it means he is a bad teacher 
it's not possible <laughs> because it's not natural to have everybody you know just in that course just doing, it's not possible it has to be a gaussian yeah it's uh, it's uh, average could be moved like and its spread could be different okay it may have more spread it may have little spread depending upon how people have adopted this it's going to be a uh, a curve like this okay they are always always going to be very smart people who really are going to love this thing they are always always people who may not find time to you know do this they are always going to be the the biggest population is always going to be here okay which are just above average average and and if it is like this there it means it is not natural that everybody is smart or everybody is dumb and there are hardly any people who are average this is not possible maybe in few nations this may be possible but usually it is not okay so you should expect all kinds of people all kinds of intellect as you can uh, as you can expect people <coughs> with all kinds of heights and weights and you know so so uh, so and then uh, it becomes it start becoming intricate i said if it's just one measurement then it is fine but once you are Uh, studying a subject then there are many 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 data points and they are, all have their own distributions i'll show you distribution of a face everything is gaussian like size of your uh, forehead and the gap your nose your height your lips everything is gaussianly distributed that's amazing part okay on, on your face everything is gaussianly distributed so there are about 18 measurements and if you take those 18 measurements of every face you will find every face <coughs> and then there is a correlation that makes things very complicated okay like the covariance matrix we have so now there is uh, one thing relates to another okay if you have a big forehead then it means that your eyes your forehead so they start relating to each other that makes the modeling very complex because they are not independent you cannot just say that these are 18 independent independent models they relate to each other okay once they, there is a relationship then you have to find one relating to each one of the others and this is what the covariance matrix gives you that relationship how one measurement relates to the other measurements whether they are totally uncorrelated or where they are really really correlated so so that's why uh, the studying uh, probability is important because it's all probability distributions that we got to Uh, we are going to encounter probability distributions of things uh, so describe the possible outcomes of an experiment and sometimes it describes just your beliefs or uh, about the likelihood of the outcome so you may have very strong belief like for tossing of a coin you have a belief like 50% 1 by 6 equal probable you know and for others yes you can always have a belief and bayes theorem can help you uh, to collect evidences and start changing start basically changing the belief as you start performing evidence or start you getting that just keep changing keep changing and then you can slowly but surely you can come to a conclusion uh, with higher probability for example you do a rapid test okay it says positive and you know that it may be negative okay <laughs> because the data tells you it is negative okay and then you have you know but now your belief initial belief whether you have covid or not it has changed you say now it seems because my rapid test is positive it means i may have covid so i should go and get my other test done right so an experimentation will help you to go take more readings more collect more evidence and then see whether your belief is changing and you can say something about uh i don't know so probability we have been studying this from our, our uh Uh, almost every degree program has probability and statistics and uh, so i i will just quickly come to the point which i want to emphasize uh, and uh, 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 spend more time on that so in in probability we say uh, there is a sample space a sample space is all possible outcome this is very important once you are studying model you should know what are the all, all possible outcome so throwing of a dice you know these are the only six possible outcomes which could be there no seventh one because it's a six faces die so you can only get one to six if you go to mcdonald and order okay and the person who is running mcdonald knows all the possible outcomes a, a person is going to come and only going to order one of these burgers okay and then based on what people are ordering everybody is i think it's lunch time so <laughs> but 
Uh, so, but you know the sample space. So the sample space is that you have to order one of these burgers and, and they know it's not equally probable perhaps for McDonald's, but how can they figure out whether it is equally probable or not for people coming and placing an order by data? They collect data and they find out that uh, most of the people will go for Big Mac. And they say, okay, Big Mac is something which we are selling more. So they could have, they, they basically steer their whole uh, supply chain management. Yeah, this is how much. And amazing, amazing thing is that almost every day they are going to see the same distribution. Though different people are coming to eat. And that's something like just surprises us that no matter which day, and you may have go, gone to McDonald's only once in a month, okay, and then there are other people who are going, and you may be ordering different things. But if you ask McDonald's, they will tell you this is a distribution. Mostly people order this, then this, then this, and, and they can even have a distribution. And distribution would be a, a Gaussian distribution that on average, is this normally this it is like very few days once we will sell more uh, big mac and there are very few days once they will hardly anybody asking for big mac okay so so that's that's what this thing is all about that if you have a humongous amount of data you can basically create models and then run your business according to those models if you just close your eyes and every day you order the same things and then you are going to throw away half of it because you know you have not studied data Okay, so the data, studying data, analyzing it is so important that that tells you and there is sometimes seasonality in the data as well. So a seasonality detection. In winter, people may have different choices. In summer, different. If there is a rain, there may be a different choice. So these are the external factors. They are going to change the mindset of people who are coming to eat something. If it is cold, people may be offering more, more coffee and you know. So the external factors start you factoring in the external factor in your models. Uh, to get more closer to the uh, to the prediction so these are for example sample grades that everybody knows that you can get an a b b plus c c plus d f or you may pass or fail the course so 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 usually outcomes are not equally likely okay mostly in real life outcomes are not just throwing off a dice as i give you an example of a burger i give you example of the code i give you example of covid they're not equally likely usually they are different depending upon the scenario. But if they are equally likely, it is very easy to calculate the probability. So one over the total population in the sample space is the probability of one event to happen. And if there are, this is A, where are the K samples, so K over N is the probability of A would happen. So you can easily calculate the probability. If you throw dice twice, then again you have a sample space where both time you can get one one or you can get one two, then you can get one three. So you can basically generate the sample space. So it is important that once you are dealing with something, you should be able to create a sample space, which is the all the outcome like I did. I said head, tail, then I figured out there are actually 12 outcomes. And all outcomes are equally likely. It means the probability of happening one is one over 12. Okay. And if you go head and tail, there are only two outcomes. So probability is one over two. If there are just dice one, it is one over six. Okay, so you can actually figure out the probability of an event, or if there is like a collection of events, and then again, you can easily calculate that uh, uh, five and a one. So there is one probability, but you say uh, six or, or something greater than this, so you can find out that what is the probability of that event to happen in the sample space. Then sometimes your sample space is continuous. Okay? It's, it is just continuous. So sometimes it is discrete, like throwing a dice and stuff is discrete. But if you are jumping from a parachute, you don't know where you're going to land. So it's a continuous sample space. Definitely you're going to land somewhere on the earth. But what precise point? So it is not a discrete point, it could be anywhere. So this is a continuous sample space where uh, you could just land anywhere, maybe. And that's the coordinate of that place could be anything. It depends how, how precisely you basically measure the first time to touch the ground. But this is called a continuous sample space where uh, the probability of that even, if it's equal probable means that then you have to find out what is the probability of you falling in this half, you say one over half. What is the probability of falling on the other half? It is one over half. You say, no, I'm dividing it one by four. So probability is one by fourth. If it is equally likely that you can just drop anywhere on this, on, on this part of the, the earth. So sometimes it, it is continuous. So, and these are again the other probability operation that uh, if these are the events, and uh, these are not the events. This, the people who have COVID, these are the people who don't have COVID. Okay, probability of having COVID is 10%, then having no COVID is 
90 percent okay so you can easily tell there may be two events they are totally uncorrelated like the throwing of a dice and a tossing of a coin they are <laughs> totally uncorrelated even they, they don't even relate to each other okay so they have other places in the sample space you say here is an event where head or tail or here is an event which is and so you can have the uh, the probability of this or this happening and they may be correlated if they are correlated then they are going to be uh, uh, overlapping each other and this is the important thing uh, which we uh, which leads us to Bayes theorem and it is sometime you have uh, 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 a priori knowledge about something and you say uh, something is given you say I'll give you a very interesting example <laughs> you say uh, given B what is the probability of A given B so this is how we write it given B so this line is given given B that you know that B has happened okay what is the probability of A for example given B the Pakistan has lost the task, toss okay and has put to bat first so now this has given now okay first is what is the probability of Pakistan winning you say it's like 60 percent now you say Pakistan has lost the toss now what is the probability of Pakistan winning you say 40 percent you say Pakistan has lost five players <laughs> in uh, I think I should not say that but you know <laughs> but you can you can always given this means it can basically help you to predict something more so you got to know what has happened so that will always help you to refine your probabilities refine your answers refine your decision making that this has happened so it is given now so it is given now now your sample space is only this much okay first your sample space was entire sample space now your sample space is this is what has happened and then so obviously once you say B is given that has happened so this is not even possible now okay Pakistan is playing so India is not playing so that just leave it so not going to look at this okay now you, your sample space is this so what is the chances of Pakistan winning once Pakistan is playing first batting first that's what they show once they are showing you the probabilities and there may be other factors you say ah, okay so I am only this is the because A has happened so my probability of A given B is left to this much because the other part has not even there now okay my sample space is reduced to B and a very little part of B is A so you say it is A intersection B divided by B okay and this probability can go here and gets multiplied it's a probability of A given B into probability of B okay this becomes a, a good expression uh, that you have a probability of A given B into probability of B okay so this is interesting okay so this is called law of total probability okay law of total probability this is your sample space for example and I have taken this example just to make you understand this is NA244 Karachi okay NA244 Karachi where they live Sindhis, Punjabis and Mahajir for example okay and now you are you are basically contesting election or you are the strategist of a party maybe Pakistan Muslim League noon or you know anybody and you say okay I'm the strategist and I'm going to look at NA244 Karachi and I know the composition of people that they are Sindhis and they are Punjabis and they are Mahajir. So B1, uh, let's say B1 is uh, Sindhis and B2 uh, is, so the sample space consists of the percentages of the people, uh, Punjabis, the voters who are Punjabis, who are Sindhis and who are Mahajir. And I also know that the, and I want to say, uh, now I want to figure out that a person who is coming to vote, okay, given that I am in, in NA244, given that these three type of people are there and knowing that once a Sindhi votes, he votes for whom? General. Once a Punjabi goes to vote, he votes for this. Just a probability of a Sindhi voting to me if it relates to, if it relates to his being Sindhi or a Punjabi or a Mahajir. And once a Mahajir comes, so what is the probability that uh, he votes for me? And what is the probability even comes to vote? Okay. What is the probability some like maybe Punjabis are lazy they say they don't go and vote in Karachi for example you say oh though given that he is Punjabi he will vote for me but the probability that he will come for vote is very later <laughs> because the data shows me that they don't come and vote. Okay? So now looking at this diagram actually you can find out your chances of winning okay? and you can find out if you are not winning why you are not winning for example you say okay this is law 
total probability i have these people and this is who i am i am the muslim league known here okay so knowing that he is uh, he is punjabi p1 is uh, sindhi let's say knowing given he is sindhi what is the probability he'll vote for me I say I have a a priori knowledge, and we have collected a lot of data. And according to the data, this is the probability a Sindhi is going to vote for Muslim League Noon, and say it is 0.2 or 0.1 or whatever. Okay, and then you say, okay, and then what is the probability of uh, he coming to vote? Let's say if he is not coming to vote, then it means that. So you multiply it with the probability that he'll come and vote, to the probability that he'll come and vote, and he'll vote for you, given that he has come to vote. He is going to vote for you. Same, same is because it's, it's, this is called law of total probability. Okay, so you can basically gauge the law of total probability is uh, given a, given a. This is who you are, and these are the the people who are going to vote for you in B1 and B2 and B3. And given this, because these people are not going to even come to vote for you. Okay, so given that this. So probability of A given B2 into B2 plus probability of given B3 into probability of B3, and you can find out. Oh, I have only 0.2 percent people, or or 20 percent people. They will vote for me, and perhaps I have this probability of of B2 is very very little, and it is though they 90 percent vote for me, but they are not going to come and vote for me. So you go and spend time here. Okay, you go and spend time here. But if you have five years and you know that Mahajis are not going to for me. So I need to do something to change their mind. So I got to spend, you know, a lot of money, a lot of efforts, and because if I want to win in this uh, particular constituency, I got to make sure that uh, uh, given B3, given somebody is Mahajir, he will vote for me. And for that, I need to do something. And I also need to make sure that he comes and vote for me. So, so this is how you basically. Uh, it's an important law of total probability, uh, where you could actually model uh, something, and then th th you can collect data. model it like this and then you can see that how it basically happens so i would just uh, uh, spend a little time about the uh, bayes theorem uh, sometimes uh, we have uh, to give a prob because saying word for pti word for ppp pmln is very cumbersome and then you cannot use uh, statistics you got to know numbers like every word we change into a vector so is every outcome is to change into a number okay every outcome you say uh, pti means that one ppp means two assume it's just a random variable what is the probability that random variable is one means what is the probability somebody will vote for pti what is the probability that x is equal to probability of x is equal to two means just the probability that somebody will come and vote for people's party what is the probability somebody will so so you assign all the events to a basically to a real number just for your ease okay so that you don't have to deal with text and you just deal with numbers so let me just uh, uh, talk to you about this bayes theorem and then we'll just end this class we have already seen that probability of a given b into probability of b is probability of a intersection b if instead of given b you can say given a again you are going to reach to the same formula but in this manner probability of b given a into probability of a and this is the most amazing formula that if you know if you know that given a what the probability of b is and you have an in initial belief on probability of a your initial trust you can modify it based on the data that you are collecting this is what the bayes theorem did that you have you have uh, an initial hypothesis okay this is your initial hypothesis these are the evidences we're going to spend more time on this these are you have an initial hypothesis as i mentioned it may be about covid it may be a per report law of total probability pe so you have a population where a test is conducted and you have now the data and you say okay this test is conducted on so many people and it says positive for so many covid positive and it says positive for so many covid negative okay so with with this information that this test once it was conducted for what population because now you have this data and with this data you can find out the likelihood probabilities and you can update the initial hypothesis that covid test and as you performing more and more and more and more test okay and you start converging to your hypothesis that covid rapid covid test is only 
this much accurate. So that a people who tested positive, should, should he be worried or should he be not worried about it? So this is what we, inshallah, once we come back, uh, we do an example also, uh, just to highlight that how we do this. And then uh, the ultimate aim is not the probability, but the distributions. So we'll come to all kinds of distributions that we have and then how those distributions can be extracted. And I'll be sharing you the thesis uh, work of one of my students, uh, where we could, we try to model uh, uh, the same, the, the distributions from uh, the people uh, on an insurance coming and visiting hospitals. And can we actually put a distribution? If we can put a distribution, then we demonstrated that we can have uh, this much of saving if we know the the data and how the people are coming to the hospital for last five years and how can we get a, a good package where we spend more money, less money and have more benefits to people. So, thank you very much. Inshallah, we'll see each other.